welcome to my not head talk. No. Talk. Talk. Um, talk. Talk. Um, talk flash CFC sponsored event. Oh yes. I mean, I had a discussion earlier. I'm excited to do a quick introduction. This is Tim. Um, so I just want to say we've been really excited to see what he's done with this project, and we hope that there's lots more. We're not sure how this story will end up. There's still lots of the distance between a really great idea and something that actually turns into a real product with real customers is a really long path. Uh, but I think Tim's got the best shot of anybody that I've seen in quite a while. And we wish you the best luck. And I'm looking forward to hearing your story. All right, well, I'll just dive right in. Um, I've got a slide here for about me that I remembered to make sure that, the, though that everybody knows who I am. <laughs> um, so hello, my name is Tim Swanson. I am a senior um, computer science digital media major. Um, I, some things about me, I was a missionary kid in Papua New Guinea, um, and lived in Texas after that, before coming to Taylor in 2018. Um, and, yeah, that's all I got there. <laughs> um, the way that this presentation is gonna work is um, we're gonna be telling a story, the story of Envisage, um, in six chapters. Um, and as every good Christian person, we've got um, six, lessons for each of the chapters, like one lesson per chapter. Um, so our, uh, we're going to get our Sunday school lesson at the end of each chapter. Um, and this is going to be kind of what I learned um, that has been felt actually quite profound to, to me through the process of Envisage. And I've learned a lot of things um, through the last two, three years. Um, and I'm really excited to get to share some of that with you guys. Um, yeah. Um, so the first chapter starts with the idea. Big surprise there. Um, every endeavor starts at an epiphany, um, and that's often like the big like idealized like, ooh, I'm an idea guy. Um, but no, this is actually really important. Um, and for me, um, the idea actually started my freshman, my first semester at Taylor, um, as a personal problem. I came in as a film student actually, um, BA film, and um, at a certain point, um, about halfway through the semester. I started to consider more seriously computer science as a major I wanted to take. Um, the problem was, because I didn't really know too much about computer science, I didn't, like, there's a lot of options in the computer science department. Uh, for majors to take, there's, there's a minor, um, and I wasn't so sure that I wanted to drop the film major, so there ended up being a lot of different permutations of majors that I could choose between. And evaluating those hypothetical situations actually turned out to be extremely difficult. Um, as it says here, it took me 20 hours to do. Um, there's no tools to facilitate the hypothetical situations. Um, and what made it even harder for me was um, when I tried to go about doing this, I had to find information from all over Taylor University. Uh, I had to find some papers from the CSE office. I had to go to the registrar to get some forms. I had to look online on, on taylor.edu. And collecting all this information ended up being really tedious. Um, and a, a, a point in the process where I could easily have, like, just not even known certain information existed to help me plan. Um, the, the defining attribute of this entire process was information overload. It was a highly stressful experience for me, and I'm the kind of person that my friends call organized. Um, the people around me um, that ha have these issues, it was even worse for. Um, so for me, my solution to this problem was to build my own system, kind of in the visit version zero. I was taking COS 120 at the time, so I knew a little bit of Python, and I decided that I wanted to script up something that would give me what I needed. Um, specifically, I was having difficulty figuring out the effective workload of various situations, like how many classes would I have to take if I became a um, film and computer science digital media double major, how many hours is that, versus if I stayed film and minor in computer science, versus um, computer science digital media versus like the vanilla uh, variant. Um, and the way that I accomplished this was very bad. Like, it was, I was a college 120 student. Um, the code is very ugly. Um, but basically all I had to do was take in a text file um, that had a list of all of the classes that I kind of took off of the PDF and manually like made it work right. And I just made one of these text files for every like chunk of requirements. I had one for the Honors Guild minor. I had one for like computer science, digital media, 
um, et cetera. And then also the splitting systems versus um, Bachelor of Arts versus Bachelor of Science. And then I would set one of the, um, set a prompt for my script. This is the one that I had actually for this run that would choose which, like I would kind of just construct my situation um, and then hit run. And it would generate this output and it would list the classes. And um, the important information that I would get from this is we would add, I would add an asterisk to any class that was redundant, that was already, that overlapped with um, one of the other majors I was taking. So like Cosmo 20 is redundant with the foundational core computing curriculum. And so then that would not count that credit, at, um, it would not list that number. Um, and then I would add these numbers up, and at the end of my execution, I had like a, I had a total number of hours that that situation would have, and then I would compare it to a couple of benchmarks. Um, if I were to take 15 credit hours for all of my semesters and do all day terms, that number would be 132. Um, this number was 148 for this situation, and that would actually be the maximum number of hours I could take without going above 17 hours. So this was information that I could get really quickly that helped me make, reach a decision on my academic planning situation. Um, and that kind of started the process of, oh, computing can kind of make this easier. Um, at a certain point, after making my own, like finishing my own process, I began to realize that I wasn't alone in the frustration and stress associated with academic planning. Um, whether you th it was somebody being really stressed like I was about choosing their major, or they were trying to figure out their four-year plan and really stressed about coming up with one to bring to their advisor, um, or even just registration and knowing what to do there. Especially as a freshman, it can be really overwhelming dealing with all the jargon, knowing that you, don't act, you aren't seeing everything there is to see, and just trying to do the best with what you have. Um, often, the kind of people that I talked to fell into two different camps. Um, along the lines of type A and type B. Um, there were some people like me who were super organized and were discontent to let this kind of go to waste um, and were willing to put in like the obnoxious amount of hours to make this work. Um, usually the way this would happen with these people was that they would make their own system using often a spreadsheet or a piece of paper um, or writing their own script in my case. Um, the alternative uh, camp that more people um, I found fell into were the people who looked at this problem, saw the hidden dragons, and did not have the emotional bandwidth to handle planning as deeply and thinking as much as they wanted, as, as they like as they really would have wanted to about their plan. Um, and what that involved was that not not necessarily that they wouldn't come up with a plan at all, but that they would do as little as they could. They would interact with it minimally. Um, maybe that meant just asking their advisor for a plan, if their advisor was willing to do that. Um, or just going semester by semester, they would only register for the classes. Uh, they would only think one semester at a time. Which inevitably would lead to the very common stories of um, people missing out on really good classes, or winding up in situ like, one, winding up in classes they don't have to take, that they don't enjoy, and then they realize halfway through that they um, didn't have to take it to begin with. Had a number of friends go through that, <laughs> um, but then also other situations that are almost so common that we've grown to accept them as normal, except that they can be pretty easily avoided just by planning ahead enough. Across the board, regardless of the type of person, I found that if you had an academic planning situation that was in any way different from the norm, um, so like for me, I was transferring a lot of classes and I was trying to figure out a, a lot of different like double major options and things like that. Um, that was different from what most, like there weren't other people like me. Um, and that was outside of the, kind of the, the path of the, the, the widest road that this system accommodated for. Um, so the people that I talked to that were most content um, with the situation were the people who just have a pretty straightforward, like I'm taking this major just like 10 other people and my advisor handed me the exact same four year plan that they handed everybody else. But if you transfer in any classes, you've already become a different situation than most people. Um, and there's a lot of other ways you can deviate from the norm there. Um, during my, the summer after my freshman year, I worked for the computer science department building the, the CC website. And one of the things that I did towards the end of that um, was I was asked to create template for your plans um, for the various, some of the majors um, that the CSC department offers. This is the computer engineering um, one. And, the objective was to create something that prospective students could look at to get an understanding of like what they would take. Um, and surprisingly, Taylor didn't have any of this to show the students. Um, fun fact, they're actually working on that now, um, except they don't look nearly as good as this. <laughs> um, 
But this this um, was my first looking into my first experience, like thinking about how one might be able to make for your plans more visually palatable, and how they could communicate relationships between classes um, in in visually understandable ways. This is the idea of visual communication. For example, just by color, you can associate the kind of those classes and also their position next to each other. Um, you can easily see like like which year you're looking at. Um, and this also allows for placeholders like in social science where is it like a class option, but you don't um, know which one yet. Um, so this process, building this right here for this one major took like several hours for me using Adobe Illustrator, like manually like drawing this out. This was not a scalable process by any means, which is the reason why Taylor doesn't have these right now. Um, but it was while I was making this that I began to realize and actually start talking about with my bosses, like the possibility of just like making this except interactable, making um, a version of this that you could click on and see the class, that you could drag around and that you could put your own data into. And that's where um, I first started thinking about like a web app as a, as a solution. Um, fast forward, well actually, not yet. Um, when I, as I started engaging with this idea and something that if, if, I, if you guys ever have or will um, go through this process of like, I have an idea, is it, is it good? Could it succeed? Um, is the question of like, if I thought of it, why hasn't anybody else thought of it? Um, usually the answer is somebody else has thought of it. They've just executed it differently. And the question is, can you execute it better? Um, for me though, there was actually some elements of people haven't thought of this and I could start to identify some patterns as to why um, so many people weren't thinking of this. First off, um, the existing tools like degree audit and registration tools are bought by administrators and faculty who do not share the experience that we as students have. Um, it's actually, degree audit, et cetera, are pretty, like, they, they get the job done when it comes to meeting um, administration's purposes. And it gets the, enough of the job done for students that they haven't been able to, like, that they haven't been sufficiently motivated to change the software or to motivate the developers of the software to, to, to create a better user experience. Um, additionally, and the students most likely to speak up about issues like this, um, it's actually just easier for them to create their own system and bite the bullet. Um, that, um, that is, that's been true for a lot of people that I've talked to. Um, many schools have recognized this problem in the publicly available software and they've created their own, um, but this is really just restricted to larger schools because they have the resources to make that. Um, when it comes to small schools like Taylor, um, where planning is actually more important because you have less class options and it's easier to get yourself in a corner, the tools are actually worse because they don't have the resources to build their own. Um, a lot of, like even the few tools that do exist that are marketing towards um, being available and like being, having a better user experience, market specifically to universities and um, are still only able to be um, bought by them. And the problem there is for us, who we aren't satisfied with the tool, or if I'm, when I wasn't satisfied with the tools I was provided and I did a quick Google to see what else I could use, there was nothing available to me because my university wasn't paying for any of those things. Um, so those tools were effectively useless for, for me. Um, so that marks the end of the, the first chapter, that of the idea. And I would say that the lesson that I learned from this was just how to interact with the notion of ideas. Um, like the statement that ideas are a dime a dozen. Um, you can have, anybody can give you an idea. I'm sure you as computer scientists have had the experience where your psst, uncle or that mom or something is like, hey, I have this million dollar idea, you should make this just because you're a programmer. Um, if you haven't had that experience, you will. Um, but then the difficulty comes in finding the diamond in the rough in those ideas. And for me, what that meant was to first realize that I cannot conjure up ideas. I can't, well, I cannot nearly as effectively conjure up ideas as I can capture them. Um, kind of think of the idea of like, like a river and um, every once in a while something good will flow by and you have to be able to pick it up when that happens and you have to be able to save it as opposed to trying to sit down and just like think of good ideas. Um, ideas come at inconvenient times. You might be taking a shower, you might be just about to fall asleep, you might be in a class where you should not be thinking about this other thing, but you are. Um, and for me what proved really effective and helpful in this was just creating a Word document called like ideas or something and just writing these things, these things down so that they could start to become externalized. Um, and fun fact, that's how Invisit was first externalized. It was like, I think my phrase was, uh, 
an academic planner that's actually good. Like, that was the full extent of my idea at that point. <laughs> um, but then the second thing I had, to, you had to, like, I had to realize was, given a list of ideas, how do I like actually, how can I actually identify a good one? Um, and that process kind of happened through through the story um, as it continued to happen. Um, but some of the attributes of it was it, it didn't like it, I kept thinking about it. I couldn't get it off my mind. I kept having other ideas of, like about how this idea, like kind of supplementary ideas about what Envisage could be, um, and um, I just needed the opportunity to, to to do something with it. And that opportunity came through through the second chapter. Um, the first step is often the hardest because that's where an idea come, goes from like out inside your head to like actually doing something about it. But the idea that can effectively compel you to do so has already like passed like probably the hardest screen for an idea to pass in the survival of the fittest, that is capitalism. <laughs> um, so for me, the way this came out was through a very unusual te technicality. Um, my sophomore J term, um, I wanted to save some money and I um, was able to get permission to stay in the honors lodge kind of as like the house manager. Um, so that way I didn't have to pay for J term. But because of a technicality where if you are living off campus, and your parents don't live within 50 miles of Taylor University, you can't get class credit. Um, so I found myself just with a J term that I had to like fill. And to, to me, I thought, why not finally like do that thing I've been thinking about? So because of that one technicality, I finally actually took action. Um, what that meant for me was I um, spent the month um, coding up a, a prototype, which you can actually visit, um, it still exists. Um, it's not great but it still was capable of demonstrating what I had in my head, the, the, some of the, the easiest ways that you could right off the bat improve, like that, how in three weeks I could create something that already was better in some ways than the existing tools. Um, and it certainly wasn't ready to replace anything just then, but it was able to demonstrate the potential. Um, the way this prototype worked for those computer scientists that would be interested, this actually didn't have a database driving it. Um, all of the data was stored um, on the client side, just on your computer, which ended up making it really easy for me to, to code up just in three weeks. Um, when I showed this prototype to, I think, Dr. Nerkula and Dr. Denning and a couple other professors at the end of J-Term, uh, was when the word startup and entrepreneurship first came up. And that was like, that was, that was so new to me. This was, up to now, this had been a personal project. This was something that I was building for my own benefit and maybe something I could share with friends. Um, but at that point, somebody else validated the potential of my idea. And that was where I was able to kind of take that next step. Um, so so the less, one of the lessons I learned from this process though, um, the, my J term consisted of a lot of just writing code in the, the guest room in the, in the honors lodge um, without really like thinking much about it. I was so excited to get something out, of, out there um, that I, didn't, I wasn't like clear-minded in writing my code. Um, and what that meant was that I was able to get, an iter like, to get that first iteration out in only three weeks, but it was unusable, like, um, in terms of like the code underneath, like, was untouchable. Um, I had effectively created a prototype, but I had not, I, like, it was nothing that I could build on anymore. Um, and um, what that ended up meaning is when we um, did end up making our beta this year, we had to start totally from scratch. So, what I did is not what I would recommend. Um, instead, what I would say is. Yes, it's important to go through the process of like get something out there and then improve that. Um, but that first thing, if you're if if you code that too hastily, hastily, or if even going beyond code, if you're doing anything and that first iteration is too hasty, you're going to spend a lot more time fixing that first thing than it, than you would have just spending a little bit more time to kind of step beyond um, that hyper focus and to make something a lot more solid with only a little bit more work. Um, so that marks the end of the second chapter. Now we're at chapter three, where I have no clue what an entrepreneur is, but I've been told to kind of start going down that path. Um, I had zero background in business, none of my family members, like I come from a missionary family, I had no idea like where to even start there. Um, I think Dr. Brandel started like arranging a couple meetings for me. I met um, Dr. Stanley's brother, Gerald Stanley, um, and started to have these meetings um, where I could, well, really the first couple meetings were just me sitting there being overwhelmed by all the terminology I didn't understand. Um, 
But through, after enough of those meetings, I started to be able to actually make sense of what I was being told. Um, and I, um, I asked a lot of questions. Understanding my ignorance, I asked a lot of questions. Um, this was the spring of 2020. So that semester, that's a semester that was interrupted by COVID. Um, so I ended up having to deal with some disappointment in anticipating being able to start and envisage my sophomore year, but ultimately not being able to do much that summer. Um, and um, kind of the way that I was able to, to handle that, um, that I've started applying for a lot of other situations as well, was to frame that disappointment as a, a fact, like a fact, a factual change, as opposed to something that I should emotionally engage with. Um, specifically when it came to, to, to accepting reality as it is. Um, and that was really helpful for me. Ultimately, like, there was only so much I could learn just by talking to people, talking to entrepreneurs. Um, I needed to take a, a class in it. So um, my, during my junior fall, this was a year ago, um, I ended, ended up signing up for Transformational Entrepreneurship taught by Professor Fennick. Um, and this class um, was great because it was project oriented, meaning I could just spend the whole class work and envisage, but while still learning the concepts I needed to know, um, as well as like all that jargon that I didn't understand before. And that was great. Um, now I understand what an MVP is or a um, total available market or like all these different concepts and I can engage in a conversation with investors or people who know their stuff when it comes to business. Um, that also equipped me to begin to prepare a pitch that I would um, at the end of the semester, uh, give at Church King, um, and ended up winning with that, um, thanks to the concepts that I had learned in that class. Um, additionally, through that class, we were able to learn the importance of uh, performing user research. Um, we sent out some surveys. One survey was to, I think, 130 students from over 20 different universities, and we were able to learn. We were one able to learn a lot, but two, we then like we we have these numbers that we can now put in our put in our slideshows and our pitches and I can use to talk to people, that empirically shows and backs up my hypothesis that things could be better. And that was really important. Um, and I was able to formalize my value proposition, which was, is just fancy words for saying, I, through this process I was able to figure out what I wanted and what I think other people wanted. Um, winning Shark Tank was great in that I won $3,000 to use for Envisage, but it was even more great in the connections that came out of it. Um, not just in the, the judges, um, although that was valuable, but also in some other connections that came from people, uh, from the validation of authenticity, of like it being a good idea that Shark Tank did for Envisage. And that was fantastic. Thanks to that, um, I, I ended up being able to um, get a donation from somebody who was impressed with what we were doing with Envisage to enable us um, to fund us towards a summer of development. And that was great to get when we got it, um, because I was able to shift from a focus of all of this entrepreneurship stuff back to a focus on planning of the product, which I think takes us to our next chapter. Oh, not yet. <laughs> um, rolling back a little bit to entrepreneurship. Um, one of the really um, fun concepts to, that Envisage has enabled me to engage with in a, in a very unique way um, has been um, thinking about ethics and technology. Um, last year I took Dr. Kramer's ethics and technology class. Um, it was the honors section and putting a bunch of honors students in a room for three hours a week and giving them contentious topics to talk about definitely was interesting. <laughs> um, but it was really good and we were able to, to grapple with a lot of really interesting questions. For example, why do companies that start with good intentions often end up bringing harm down the road? Um, what responsibility do the producers of tools bear over the misuse of those tools. So for example, if I'm building an app, a social media app and that starts being used for abuse, or if I'm, like a really common one is like the whole notion of, is the person who, like of gun law, of is the person who um, enables gun access responsible for the misuse, or is the person who misuses the tool responsible? And to what extent those, those combine? Um, and another really interesting question um, was, um, when is it okay for businesses to act in their own interest rather than the public interest? Um, and a lot of what we talked about in Cameron's class um, was from the perspective of how can we uh, be users of technology? Because that, um, in all fairness, is what most people in the room would be concerned with. How can, we, how can we engage with this as a general population? But a really unique position that I had was that I 
actually was in the position of starting a company. Um, and, and as we talked about how a lot of tech companies um, said one thing but did another, I didn't, that was not something that I at all wanted in business to be at risk of becoming. Um, so I engaged with the question of how should I do envisage differently? How, how would I lead a startup in a way that um, could truly um, preserve the, the good intentions that it started with? Um, and one of, one of the epiphanies that came in this question was in thinking about how um, companies, um, their metrics for success, their, their win conditions. Um, for example, Facebook, what they care about is their page views, their ad revenue, the amount of time spent on their app. And it shows in the decisions they make. Um, whether or not it's good for us, they design their app to have a bottomless pit because they know that we'll keep scrolling, even if that ends up rotting our brains or whatever all the psychological effects of that are. Um, so for me, what that meant was that I needed to come up with metrics of success um, that would actually evaluate the, the, the mission that I had with Envisage, as opposed to um, limiting it just to revenue or, or page counts or whatever. Uh, and that was a really, that, it's obviously a lot harder to come up with a metric for what is the impact I'm having on my users and am I making their lives better? Um, and that's not a solved problem. I, I can't tell you this is the exact formula I'm gonna use to do that. But now I know to pursue that as I continue forward with Envisage. Um, another key concept that I learned through Professor Fennig's uh, transformational entrepreneurship class um, was the notion of it really is about redemption. When especially as a, um, the idea of business when it comes to being a Christian. Um, we learned about three different categories um, that, that all business falls into. Um, first category, we understand pretty well, exploitative business. These are the businesses or business practices that bring harm to others or to the environment um, in, in exchange for one's own benefit. Um, and this sometimes can be illegal, other times it's, it's within the bounds of the law, but we still don't like it. And that often is not a successful business practice, but some people have managed to find business models that are exploitative that work. A much more common and something that's becoming a lot more hip these days is the ethical business. Um, and we see this a lot, companies bragging very vocally about how they're making the right choice and how, how they're um, caring for you in the decisions that they make. And they're not wrong, they're not lying to you. The, the decisions that they make in these areas are tangibly benefiting you in ways that, um, that they wouldn't have before. So it's certainly better than exploitative, but the key difference is that they are still primarily motivated through money. They are using ethical actions as a means to the end of money. And why that matters is because when we look at an issue that's not in the public eye, you will see ethical companies be a little less admirable in the way they make those choices. And that still ends up bringing limitations to the, to the good that those companies can bring. So that's where we get to the third level of goodness of a business, and that's redemptive business and redemptive entrepreneurship. Um, by definition, the very reason for existence of a redemptive business is to bring, is to make the world a better place and to actually mean it, for that to be the core desire of a business, not to, be, to make a living, not to make money, not to get power, or to, be, or to live up to the idealized image of an entrepreneur, um, but to make the world a better place. And the important caveat there is that a redemptive business can still turn a profit, and it, money is still a huge um, factor of what's going on there, because money is, in a capitalist world, money is the fuel that the engine of entrepreneurship runs on. And that becomes a really important concept as we get to our, the lesson learned from this chapter. Um, that companies and businesses are powerful engines to bring profound evil or redemption. Um, I feel like before I learned this lesson, I was copiously aware of all of the harm that the world of business, business brought. But I learned through this process the profound good um, that these could bring to this world. Um, this brings us to the next chapter, actually sitting down and planning out what Envisage would be. Um, this was, um, this, this happened during J-Term actually of this year, J-Term of 2021, um, utilizing um, a really neat aspect of the computer science department, the advanced project, which is where you just get class credit to work on an approved um, project. 
Um, it's, it's really a win-win-win um, in our situation because um, the students um, are able to get class credit to work on interesting problems and write code that's never been written before that will actually get used to serve um, people. Uh, Envisage gets manpower and Taylor gets tuition with low faculty uh, hours. So it's, it's a great, great trade-off. Um, so, so myself and Liz Yider um, spent our J term um, doing advanced projects and the pro um, what we chose to do at that time was to just think about the design. Um, to build what are called wireframes through, through the design process um, that if, if any of you have taken Dr. Hipschman's Principles of Human-Computer Interaction, going exactly through that process. Um, and then in the spring, we were able to move beyond that towards some of the more tangible, what are the technologies we're going to use? Um, what are the specific features we're going to have? Um, and choosing that project scope. Um, these are um, some images from our J term of planning that I thought would be really interesting to show. Um, we spent the J-term working in Euler 200, if, if you know the room, um, and um, these are some of the white the, the order of process that we went was um, thinking about user stories um, and actually engaging with the question of what's the actual problem, and then writing those on sticky notes and drawing out ideas for Envisage and just piecing those sticky notes um, to where features actually solve problems. And through that process, we were then able to iterate a lot about what we wanted a visit to look like. This is where it took shape, um, the website that we see today. Um, for example, this is actually pretty similar to the semester view that Envisage has right now, but this was a drawing where we came up with how we would lay out all of that information and how it would behave. This was the process that I used to come up with how, um, I had the idea of what if we had a compass that actually did something rather than it just being in the logo. So it started with the idea of branding, but then it turned into an idea of how we could articulate succinctly um, a student's um, status in their plan. And it's actually, it's actually pretty hard to figure out how you turn a compass into a gauge. Um, and we had to really try a lot of different things to figure out how not only we could indicate spinning, but how, like, for example, we tossed around a lot the idea of northeast, southwest, except that that doesn't really indicate, like, no one direction is better or more complete than the other. Um, so we ended up um, abst like abstracting it to, to what you have in business right now, um, which have these like circular graphs, but still have the, the fun needle things that actually spring. Um, here is an example of a wireframe, which is kind of like a glorified drawing. That's a good way to think of it, except done digitally. Um, this this was our wireframe for what at the time was called the advisor view. Um, and you can, if you've looked around Envisage much, some of these elements will look pretty familiar. Um, except that this view actually ended up not happening um, when we built Envisage this summer. But because we were able, able to draw this out here, we didn't have to write all this code for something we ended up not using. And that's some, that was a lot of time saved through the process of uh, wireframing. Um, yes, this is what it looks like to have like a series of wireframes. Um, to like to, to flush out a full app. It's just basically a lot of different pictures, and you can what you can do is you can create a a, a semi-functional prototype where you create like buttons where if you click on like this tab, it takes you to the other picture, and you can <coughs> then do user tests like that to figure out how everyday people interact with things that look like your app. Um, so in the spring, we also had um, we had five students doing advanced projects for that. And um, we got a lot done through that, um, that enabled, ultimately enabled us to get a lot more done in the summer. Our goal with the summer was that that would be when we do all the coding, and we'd be, but we'd be prepared to hit the ground running. Um, to do so, the spring meant um, coming up with our basic ERD and um, deciding on our technology stack and um, <coughs> asking all those questions of, um, should we use a RESTful API or a GraphQL API? And not being so sure if we made the the right decision on that specific one, but oh well. <laughs> um, and um, that was a really important part of the process of, of the spring. Some other things that happened were um, meetings with a lot of different Taylor faculty, um, culminating in me presenting to 20 of Taylor's top administrators, including President Paige Cunningham, Provost Mike Hammond, the deans, everybody up there, um, presenting to them um, the idea, like pitching a uh, partnership between Envisage and Taylor University and kind of showing them all of the opportunity for both Taylor and its students 
that would come out of a partnership through, um, through this. And um, that presentation um, started a conversation that's still ongoing, um, even though it's slow going. It's okay. <laughs> um, and some other things that we were able to do through this process was have the chance to develop like our workflow. Um, I didn't know what an agile workflow was, but through this process, we basically reinvented that, which is kind of cool. Um, and we were able to figure out how we um, manage tasks, how we manage projects, how we come up with a timeline, and um, how we can communicate with a team of three people um, across all of the different uh, things that we need to communicate about. Um, and one of the great things about spending, uh, having advanced project time um, for David and Connor, who were the people I ended up hiring for the summer, um, was that they were able to start learning their technologies and figuring things out um, during the slow pace, one credit hour class that was advanced project of the spring. So that when we started in the summer, that, that, that usually really intimidating learning curve that you have when you start a job for the first time, they were already ready to just get started on day one, which was um, really good. Um, and yeah, that marks the end of the planning um, chapter. And one of the things that I, that I learned from this was to solve problems for humans, you must understand humans. And this is an often under, misunderstood or under understood um, concept in the world of technology. Um, it's really easy for us computer scientists to, or other STEM fields to get wrapped up in the, the coolness of technology or the problem solving, like solving technical problems. But ultimately, if you aren't solving a person's problem, you're not gonna get anywhere. Um, and one of the really cool things about how this factors into Taylor University and its central ethos is that being a well-rounded individual who has been holistically developed um, and is well-rounded um, is more equipped than most other computer scientists to make the right decisions when solving human problems. And that's, I just think that's awesome. Um, another element that comes into that is when you learn more about the world, you start to care more about the problems and the suffering in the world. And people know, people can tell when you care and what you care about. And that's gonna make a big difference on when you're trying to sell something. So now we're at um, the stage of actually building a product. And this is where we get to learn more about how Envisage actually works and the process of really developing. Our, our objective was in three months, and this happened this summer, in three months, build from scratch a web application that can do it, all of the things that we want to do when we launch in August, um, which is a tall order. Um, so, few hack hyper montage. <laughs> um, for me, it was a little, uh, it was a little bit more than just all of the coding, though, um, because as the leader of a startup, you've got to wear a lot of hats. Um, and for me, what that meant was that I had to function as the product owner, um, which if you're familiar with Agile, you know what that means. But what that means is that I was the one that had to make the decisions about what Envisage looked like and what it did. Like, I was the one who made those calls. Um, and, then, and then the three of us would implement the code to make that happen. I was also the project manager, kind of like the scrum master, uh, where I was responsible for figuring out the tasks, figuring out deadlines, figuring out how we were gonna get all of this done in time and stay on track. I was also responsible for the majority of the front end. I built all of the core UI, um, which is a full-time position in itself. Uh, this was a busy summer for me. <laughs> Um, but kind of in stark contrast to all these things, all of those things, I was also the data monkey. I had to go through the painful process of um, getting the area of study information, like majors and minors, off of a PDF, um, which are annoyingly inconsistent from major to major and department to department. So I had to literally read through every major that Taylor University offers and conform the data to be consistent um, so that Envisage would have anything at all. Uh, if you've used Envisage and notice that the data is a little bit not 100% correct, just be glad that it's there at all because I worked very hard for, for that. It wasn't pleasant, but part of being the leader of a startup is you've got to be capable of filling all the gaps that, that aren't there. Um, so the lesson learned here for me was you got to be prepared to wear a lot of hats if you want to lead a startup. Um, and that involves taking a broad education. Um, I've taken a lot of different classes in a lot of different departments. This is a list of the classes that during my uh, journey with Envisage have been directly utilized to get Envisage, to make Envisage happen. This is excluding all of the classes that have indirectly been related. Um, but this is a long list. The ones in bold are the ones that were critical um, and like super helpful in making 
um, in Vintage Happen. For example, Dr. Nurkula's uh, full stack web development class, like that's what gave me everything I needed to know to be able to make that first prototype. Um, so that ended up being a valuable lesson for me. Um, and now we get to learn a little bit about how Invisit works, and David will explain that in color. Well, hello everyone, my name is David. I am a senior computer science systems student here. And uh, I worked on Envisage uh, during that spring term and that one credit planning period. And then he also hired me to work full time over the summer on it. And uh, a lot of my role is kind of a little bit of everything. Um, I. I would say I kind of felt uh, I set the foundation for everything, and I primarily manage our infrastructure. Um, and it's been really cool to see what we have been able to build and such a small team, such a small budget, um, and we just use pretty cool technologies. So, get into that a little bit. Uh, I have this wonderfully scary graph here, and what's important is that it kind of describes these two camps here. So we have our back end and our front end. Uh, our back end is basically the part of our software that handles all of the, the data handling and the logic. And then the front end here is the, the pretty user interface that you actually see when you go to the website. <coughs> so I'm just gonna kind of break down how everything plays together. And uh, lucky for you, this is actually a simplified version of how everything works. <laughs> um, so I'm sorry if it's still a little hard to follow. Uh, so on the front end here, uh, our framework that we use is called Vue. Um, it's one of the major three front end frameworks that exists for the web, um, created by uh, Evan Yu, uh, who's an ex Google engineer. Um, and with Vue, we use Vueify, which is kind of like a styling framework um, that gives us a bunch of default styling uh, for free and saves us a bunch of time. Um, and all of this actually sits within a, a, a super framework called Nuxt, which gives us uh, more features built in, like routing. So being able to go to slash home and slash plan isn't something that comes by default. You usually have to build it out. Um, so Nux actually gives us that for free. Um, and we use some technology there. Um, so kind of following along the graph here, when Tim or I make a change to the front end, we push that code out to a GitHub repo, uh, one specifically for the user interface. Um, a GitHub repo is basically Google Docs for code. Um, it's great for collaborating on projects together at a really big scale and keeping track of all the different changes we make. So once we make a change in our repo and push it up there, that automatically triggers a build and deploy action in Firebase, which is a company that was purchased by Google a few years ago, and they're known for um, hosting and some really nice uh, framework type services. So it goes into Firebase, it gets built and deployed, uh, basically turned into just static files. And those static files are then sent up to their hosting platform, uh, which is then served globally from at envisageplanner.com. Uh, so that's kind of the story of how we get from our front end framework code here all the way out to the web. Uh, and I'm also gonna break that down here for our back end. Uh, it's a little bit of a uh, simpler stack, thankfully. So we use a framework called Fastify, uh, which is largely based off of Express. Um, if you worked in web development, you've definitely heard of Express. It's extremely popular. Um, but the main thing about Fastify is that it's extremely fast, which means that we save money on servers um, and can and serve more people with less resources. Within Fastify, we use a ORM, which is an object relational uh, model, called Prisma. Prisma is how we talk to our database. Um, it saves us a lot of headache creating queries by scratch because it kind of makes it more verbose. 
So instead of writing in machine language, you can just tell Prisma, um, hey, I want to get this user if their name starts with uh, a D. And it would translate that for you. And it's really great. So similarly with the front end here, when we make a change to our back end, that gets pushed up to a separate GitHub repo, Solar Code. And that also automatically triggers an action uh, in Cloud Build. And this is actually uh, a Google Cloud service. So GCP stands for Google Cloud Platform. Um, it's one of the three major cloud hosting services. Uh, cloud Build creates a container image from our code, uh, which basically means that it creates a replicatable uh, computer data. So it can then take that data and clone it to all these bunch of little small servers and so they can all be running the, the same software at the same time. So once that image is built here, it gets pushed to Cloud Run, which uh, automatically scales and manages our backend servers. It's amazing. We save so much money using it because we can actually set it up to automatically scale down to zero servers. So we actually could potentially not pay anything if no one's actually using the server at any given moment. Um, and from there, we get all the way up to web with API plan. So once that is kind of demystified, uh, and I'll go over this a bit later, over here we have the Taylor catalog, uh, and with a little bit of blood, sweat, and tears, we push that through a file scraper, and then a data updater, and then through Prisma, which then gets routed over to our uh, database server here, Cloud SQL, um, to then be usable uh, by everyone. Um, and I forgot to mention, uh, we also use Google Cloud Identity Platform uh, for authentication, which basically gives us Google-grade authentication and security for very cheap price. Um, and I'll kind of go over that in a little bit. So we had a major challenge, and that was getting data. We had no help from the administration at Taylor to get access to uh, the degrees, uh, any course information, any section information. So we basically uh, said, OK, we'll just make it work. We'll figure something out. Um, so our solution to getting data is great. And it took a lot of time to solve. So just to give you an example, um, so this is kind of the start of the process of us uh, gathering data for degrees. Um, we basically took all the PDFs from each major, uh, put them in a Google Drive folder, uh, looking like that. We then converted it into just a regular text file, which kind of changed the formatting as you see here. Um, it, it simplified it a little bit to make it easier to work with but not perfect. Again, Tim spent so much time working through that stuff. Um, and from there, we wrote a script that turned that data into a JSON file, which is actually readable by our server and our computers. Um, and we had to kind of come up with a specific, specific format we wanted those to be in so that it made sense and we could expand on it later, uh, breaking everything. With that data, we can give you stuff like this. So I think this example on the right here is the coolest thing that we've done. <laughs> so, and, and Tim mainly did the, the front end design for this and code. Uh, so within a class on Envisage, uh, we can actually guess and estimate when a class is going to be offered and at what time. And for me personally, that was a huge problem when I was planning for my semesters. Because um, you'd be going back between the degree audit and then the registration tool. And yeah, it's a huge thing. Um, so uh, we can estimate things like that. And we can also show um, the historical time changes. So you can see when a class was offered uh, previously, when it is now. Um, maybe it will change this year. Who knows? Um, and then on the left side here, this is a degree and all of its glory. Um, this list 
is the different lists and groups of requirements. And on the right side is the sub requirements within each group here. Uh, so this is a degree, this is like a specific class and section. Um, one of the coolest problems I solved this summer, I think, is multi-tenancy. And multi-tenancy is the idea that you are a, so we are software as a service. Um, we are going to offer uh, our code to schools for them to individually host themselves. Um, that just creates a, a lot of headache and um, a lot of potential for uh, security issues later down the line. Um, so, doing a software as a service where we host everything for everyone, you get the issue of, okay, I have all these different schools' data, um, how do I keep them straight, how do I make sure this user goes to this university, um, and how do I connect those and keep them safe? So, um, multi-tenancy specifically is that you have multiple tenants, and each tenant in our case is a university. Um, and I solved the, the problem of connecting uh, universities to their like emails, sort of. So an example of how that plays out here is in our sign-in UI. So if Tim put in his tailored email and clicked next here, uh, it would go to this screen, and this is uh, very much inspired by the Google login page, so it should look very familiar. Um, but most importantly, it recognized that he had an account here, um, so it didn't give him an error. And then it also said, oh, you're signing into Taylor University because you had a Taylor uh, email. Um, I can tell you what you're gonna log into, and then from there, I can show you Taylor's resources, not Ivan's resources. Um, and this is very important uh, if we are gonna scale up in the future, because this, is the framework for us to be able to integrate directly with the school's authentication system. Um, we would be able to do that within a day um, with very little work, thanks to what I was able to And uh, this is basically reiterating all the, the stack information that I already gave you, so I can kind of skip through this. Um, and our infrastructure is basically hosted by Google Cloud and Firebase, but Firebase is also a product of Google Cloud. These are, uh, again, our backend technology. And you get to explain this thing. <laughs> Hi, I'm Connor White. I am our primary backend. Uh, developer for Envisage. Tim recruited me last spring. He told me a bit about Envisage, and I'm kind of weird like Tim, and I liked planning for my four years at college, so I thought, hey, this is a really great idea. I knew a lot of people who had literally not graduated because they messed up their four-year planning and nobody told them. It's so, like I saw a real need for this. So they recruited me for backend. I didn't even realize how blurry this thing is because I'm a backend guy. I don't pay attention to user details. But, um, so I worked with our API and our database. So the API, as David kind of explained, is something that grabs information from the database and then brings it to the front end so people actually see it. So if you could, if you can kind of read this, how does this light work? Press the big button. <coughs> the light button, okay. So if you can kind of read this, uh, you can see how all of this stuff is intertwined and related to each other. So something like a plan has plan terms that is related to terms that is somewhere on this board. But like, you can see how everything is super interconnected with each other. And something that I did with the API, when we got asked, can I get plans of a specific user? So, and then within that user, or what the user is planning, I can ask for their courses. And with those courses, I can see what terms they're taking them in and then just a whole bunch of weird complex puzzles like that, trying to grab courses, plans, uh, areas of study, all being integrated into each other and bringing it up to the front end so you can actually see what's going on. So this is a whole complex mess, but it all honestly works together really well. We spend 
like a few days designing it, just like the three of us sitting down so that we'd all know what it looks like. And then from there, we just kept building it out. And then I just wanted to show you guys a few examples of what Prisma and Fastify actually looks like. So Prisma is an ORM, which means you can actually write the database with Prisma initially. So right here is a requirement, this is something that a degree has. So it needs a course, it needs the course ID, and then what the requirement like group is. So it's like COS120 is a core requirement, so that'd be the group that it'd be a part of. So instead of going in and writing SQL to make the table, I can just write Prisma code to make the table, which was super cool, because we just had a whole file of all of our <coughs> Prisma code, and I could just go add a table in like 30 seconds, which was super awesome. And then this is the handler of Prisma, kind of what I was talking about before. So this is planning a featured plan specifically. Which, so right here, I'm asking if a plan is featured, if that is true, I want to include all the plan terms, all the areas of study, and all the plan courses, and then put that in ascending order. So it was super simple. It's pretty much writing English to the computer. Tell me, give me these three things, and then it gave it right back to me, which was awesome. And then this is a bit of what FastFi looks like, the uh, web framework. So it's pretty much making the routes that the front end guys would call. So if they want to call featured plans, they just slap in a get request for featured plans and then return all that for them. And then David made some super cool things with their authentication. So right here, I put in a prehandler of saying, making sure somebody has an account, otherwise they cannot access this stuff. So somebody across the world or at Taylor doesn't have an Invisus account, can't start attacking and doing a bunch of requests against us unless they had an Invisage account. And then also, just I was able to write a, a little like schema with it, with Swagger, which was super cool. So if Tim or David wanted something that I wrote, so like right here, this is changing custom credits of a course. So I want to make a course have four credit hours instead of three. I could say, in the summary, change the custom credits of a planned course for a user. If Tim wanted something like that, I could type that up in the summary and then it post on our Swagger docs, which is just like a giant list of all the routes that I made. And Tim could find a description of, oh, we have a request that creates a custom credit for a specific course, which is really nice. So they didn't have to keep, we all didn't have to keep asking each other for stuff. Maybe we would anyways, because they're sitting two feet away from each other. But if anybody ever needs to go back, we have an entire documented list of everything that we wrote <coughs> with the API. An example of something that I did this semester with this, which was really fun, we all kind of sat down and decided we wanted to make surveys so that users could reply to questions that we were asking them. So with uh, Prisma, I quickly wrote just two little tables, uh, survey questions, and then the answer surveyed. Like, so what a user would respond. So we could store the questions that we are sending them and the response they send us. So I wrote two tables, wrote a little uh, Prisma query, where I give people survey questions that they have not answered yet specifically. Once they answer it, they would no longer get it anymore. And then just a way for a user to send us the responses to the surveys. So within like an hour, I think I made something that fast with these technologies, which was super fun and super cool. Awesome. So the lesson learned there. Um, walking into this, I know I at least felt totally underqualified to build a web application and to do all of the things surrounding it. Um, what I learned, though, is that even if you feel underqualified to do something, um, it doesn't mean that it's impossible um, if you're willing to put in the sweat to, to learn how to do it and to struggle through it. Um, this entire process has been characterized by me having no idea what I'm doing, and that's OK. <laughs> um, yeah, so now we're at the last chapter, and that's just releasing, releasing this product into the wild. Um, this has been kind of the objective of this of this last semester, as well as where we're going into the future. Um, one of the interesting aspects of a of that happens when you release a product, um, uh, one, you're making a commitment that the data, like you can't just willy-nilly break everything or delete all your data. Like it, it's it's a pretty serious responsibility. Um, but also when you're re when you're doing a launch, what else is going on is that you're submitting your hypothesis to the world for them to decide if you're right. Um, for me, what that meant was, like, I, for years, have been like, okay, I am, I am operating on this hypothesis that academic planning can be made better and that students want it to be better. Um, but ultimately, 
the way to prove that was to launch Envisage and to see, see if students agreed. Um, and that, what that didn't mean was that Envisage had to get everything right the first time, but it had to demonstrate the potential for improvement. So during this semester, um, a lot of the objective was to build a user base. Um, we launched our beta in August of 18th, um, towards the end of our summer. Um, and through word, that we really just spread word through like word of mouth, group me, et cetera, at that point. Got about 50 users in the first couple of weeks, which is a good small number where we could start having people like submit bug reports and show us what was wrong. And we wouldn't be too stressed when we find a bug because not too many people are using it. So it was a really good slow way to start. Um, and then throughout the semester, I was able to engage in a lot of individual and group advising sessions um, where I was able to answer a lot of questions um, about advising because I love doing that. But then also to use Envisage and show them how to use Envisage. Um, one, so that they could benefit from knowing how to use Envisage. And two, so that I could, like it would, it would be a really good user test where I could learn how well they were learning, they would learn to use Envisage, um, and I could watch the way that they interacted with it. Um, some of the other fun things that got to happen this semester, I'm in a class called Web Animation right now, um, and I had the opportunity for one of the projects to, to create like, um, animation through our website and to make my landing page nice and swanky. So if you go to it, it's got all the fun motion that makes it way more engaging. Um, and that's actually really significant. That's not just a cool thing, um, because our landing page is where I send to everybody that I want to learn more about the visage. That's what that was the the, route we, the URL we put on our posters and our pamphlets that we put around, because we want that first impression to be really solid, so that we actually have some like so that we can actually have a second impression. Um, this is a this is a graph from uh, Google Analytics of our user activity over the last month or two, um, and um, this right here. I think was the day that we put our posters out, and there was a, a significant spike. This first line is our daily, the number of visas we had over over a given day. This is over a given week and a given month. Um, so at this point, we had had 419 people um, visit our our site, and that day um, was 36 people. Um, and that's that's make like that's removing like duplicate visits and things like that. Um, and one of the great things about this semester is that we've had over 200 accounts created by students at Taylor um, just from this first advising season. So that means that like 10% of Taylor students have an Envisage account in any given room. You're looking at like there will be people in there who have Envisage. And the great thing about that um, is um, that we now have, we have our foot in the door. And those 200 people hopefully will like what they've used and they'll <coughs> recommend it when the next Years freshmen come in, and they'll recommend it to their friends even this spring when the next advising season happens. Um, so the hope is that each advising season will have one of these spikes, and it'll just get higher and higher, kind of stair step. Yeah. So the lesson learned through the semester: um, make a good plan, but hold it loosely. Um, one of the one of the other attributes of this semester has been one of disappointment. Um, aiming, um, as David mentioned. We, we wanted to be able to connect um, to the database that Taylor has for, for areas of study um, and classes and things like that because it's just way more reliable and easier to get. Um, but due to various reasons, we were unable to do that. Um, but rather than let that stop us from launching for the advising season, um, we, we um, amped up some of our other functionality to, to, to make that work. Um, and that ability to pivot ended up being really fundamental, like really significant. In, making the most out of this semester. Um, and this is, this is the URL for, for the app, if any of you haven't been. But also, if you haven't been, I'm curious as to why you're here. So I'll move on. <laughs> um, yeah, so next steps. This is, this is where we'll end, just talking about what we're looking forward to. There is an overwhelming amount of ways in which we can make students' lives better through Envisage. This is just the list that earlier today, like I threw together, based off of what like first showed up in my mind. But like in reality, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of of things that I've been like, this is something that needs to happen, like in a world of infinite resources. Um, ultimately, the way that we have to approach this is just keep developing one at a time. Get one each of these done. Like we can't get it all done, but just as long as we keep improving um, and keep pursuing um, that 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 growth. 
Um, hopefully we'll be able to, 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 to tackle more of these opportunities for improvement. Um, and I'll just touch on a couple of these that are interesting. UI assisted planning, basically what that means is um, that there are ways that we can change the interface, um, which is the thing you interact with, um, to make it help you plan in really easy ways. Uh, one of the hardest things, like one of the most, not hardest, but most annoying, frequent things you have to do when making a plan is know what semester that class is being offered when you're choosing to place it. Well, what if you could just, while you're dragging, like in visits you can drag and drop classes, what if while you're dragging a class, it just highlighted the semesters that, that, were, like, that that class was available for? Now all of a sudden you've removed all of the work, the mental load that students had to do to figure out when a class is available, and they can just visually see all of the semesters that are their option and they can place it based on that. So that's an example of a way that the UI can help. Um, we also want to add peer-to-peer -peer advice. Um, right now it's really, like the most valuable th asset you can have with academic planning, well, arguably, um, is access to a student who's already taken the class and to ask them um, what it's about, if you should take it, how to take it well. Um, and there's no forum to facilitate getting that advice from upperclassmen. Um, the closest thing we, we might think of is Rate My Prof, um, which is hated by most profs for good reason. It's just functionally a popularity <coughs> contest. And it doesn't really give you helpful information about your classes. It tells you everything wrong about them, which isn't going to make you more excited to engage in your class. Um, so what we want to do is have the ability for students to give advice, not necessarily complain about classes, but give advice for the benefit of others. Um, this last one I want to touch on, because I think it's really cool. Um, this, I had this idea a couple of hours ago. <laughs> I was talking with Zach Winters. We were complaining about how, especially during finals week, you'll have points where a bunch of your professors accidentally, like without knowing about it because they're not communicating, like have things due at the same time. And you have these really annoying spikes in, in the amount of work you have to do. And if you're a really organized person, maybe you anticipate this ahead of time. And if you're super disciplined, you can spread out the work and get it done ahead of time. But most often, what that results in are miserable weeks, miserable days, all-nighters, things that are not healthy for students' well-being and create the cliches, anxiety, and stress. Um, so what if professors had the ability to, to for their classroom, see what, all, what, what the aggregate workload that their classroom had over time in, in a heat map, um, so, so that they could time their assignments according to the, the, the workload that their, that their students have. And that would be done based off of professors, um, either professors or students of those classes, submitting um, kind of like a schedule um, to, to something like Envisage. And I think that'd be really cool. That would also enable students when they're um, assembling their semester to know, they could literally look at, a, look at a heat map over time of the 16 weeks of the semester, and they could see based off of the shade of color how, like, how bad it's gonna get. And maybe there's one week that is literally impossible, and they're gonna either know not to take a certain class, or they're gonna know to get a lot of work done ahead of time. Um, so I think that's really cool. Um, and now I wanna make that a JTRM project. <laughs> yeah, that made it as possible. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so some, some last things. Um, what future steps hinge entirely on understanding what people want, not just what I want. Like there's an infinite list of ways to, to improve that I can choose from. But what I really need is for people like you and the public to, to express interest in certain functionality so that we know what to emphasize. And so that we know that we should keep working on this at all. Um, and we should tell more people about Envisage. Envisage can't help people that don't know about it. Um, and and um, in the future we'll also continue working with university administration trying to get further with the relationship between Envisage and Taylor, as well as potentially other universities that also have this problem. All right. Um, yeah, that's, that's the end of the presentation. Can I open to any questions if anyone has any?
more questions? Although I plan to, but this is my last semester, so yeah, I'm literally hard to be planning easy. to do. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, is there like an easy way on the app for people to give you their feedback and express their interests in things that they won't work on? Yeah, the bug report button. And also the survey window. Yeah. Excellent. Give us feedback if you have. <laughs> we look at it. What's one thing, if you could go back and change one thing that you did, or two, whatever, mm -hmm. what would you do differently? I mean, I might change the GraphQL. <laughs> I was talking to Dr. Arthur about that earlier today. Um, that's a, that, that would be the technical, like a technical answer. Um, what would I do differently? We had good reasons to use Rails. We did, yeah. But now that I know how, like, more about GraphQL, I don't, I don't know. It, it's too late now. We, we're, we're kind of committed, so it's fine. Rest, restful APIs are really good too. <laughs> um, I let's see. I probably would have start like done the wireframing step before I would have done the prototyping step. Um, that's just that's the more conventional route for a reason because you can build a wireframe a lot faster than you can build a literal like web page that does the things. Um, so I probably would have done that more. Um, the reason that I started with a prototype web page was because that's what I knew and that I hadn't done any wireframing. What else? Um, um, there was really unfortunate timing with the, uh, the leadership transition. Um, I pitched to, like, like, I had a really good pitch to the president and provost right before they left, <laughs> which was kind of problematic that when they left, like, image fell in the hands of people. Uh, what was the statement? Uh, there was a new pharaoh in the land who did not know Joseph, or something like whatever the saying is. <laughs> there was a new pharaoh who did not know Joseph. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of what happened. Um, and we're still, and so now we just have to kind of reestablish that um, with the new leadership. So probably, like, I would have done something differently there. Either, like, waiting, either waiting until the transition happened and then putting, like, all of that work into it, or or on the flip side, like in some way capitalizing more on the existing relationship I had with like, leadership and like the enthusiastic support that I had with like Paige and Mike, um, maybe anticipating more the disruption that the uh, transition might have caused. What's the future of Envisage after you graduate? Good question. <laughs> um, you got the funding for it? <laughs> 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 so yeah, like this kind of goes back to the flexible plan thing. Um, what one of the things that is important is that I don't want to kind of like sell my soul to the first person with money when it comes to envisage. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, like I could just look for the first investor willing to to, to, to throw money my way, but. A lot of investors are motivated by money, and that gets, that's where you get you move away from redemptive entrepreneurship, and um, and the people that would invest in me would have an influence on the decisions I would make, like out of necessity. That's like that that is a good model. Um, so I want to be able to choose my investors well. If that makes sense. Not necessarily that they exactly agree with me, but that they have compatible visions. Um, and I can't do that if Envisage absolutely has to have an X amount of funding by X amount of time. So what that means for me is having a good plan B. Um, so I've been doing like the job search and like um, I'm aiming to do like to get a full, like to get an offer for a full time job that I would start at the end of the summer so that I would have the opportunity to do another summer of development for Envisage um, and then keep it as a project. Um, during which there is there will always be the opportunity for uh, like that for for the person to come along that's going to be like that person that really believes in what Envisage is doing that can provide the resources for us to like tackle that list of solutions and, and build something that we're ready to, to sell but until then it'll just be continuing to take advantage of advanced projects and working in my free time on It's not going away though. Like even if we stopped developing Envisage, we've got a budget to keep hosting it for many years. <laughs> budget. Budget. Yeah. Yep. 
What's one thing that you think you did really right? Um, choose classes well. Like you saw that list of classes. That class, that list doesn't fit into any one degree. Um, I don't think. Um, so I'm I'm really glad that during my four years at Taylor, I I took the approach I did, even if it didn't fit into a specific job. Like it is frustrating now that I'm trying to find a job that like. I have such a broad experience, but not, like, I'm not the perfect candidate for any one entry level position. <laughs> but it's been super great for Envisage um, because I have been able to learn how to do a lot of things um, and wearing a lot of hats. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for coming, guys.